Season 2 ended and Maurice Hurley left Star Trek The Next Generation. And there was much rejoicing. Michael Wagner took over as head writer, but after four episodes he says screw it and left. Into his shoes came Michael Piller, who had impressed Rick Berman and Gene Roddenberry with his work on this episode. New costumes were introduced for the main cast members that would later this season become finalized into their well-known woolen versions. A new title sequence was created, Dr. Pulaski left without so much as a piss off and good riddance, and Dr. Crusher was back. Jordy and Worf both got promotions, even the cinematographer was changed, and the show's look somewhat altered. Essentially, when you saw the Enterprise's gradual reveal against the stars, you were seeing the launch of TNG Mark II, which would kick off the series' golden age with a stronger emphasis on character and a more modernized style of storytelling compared to the previous two seasons that seemed like they were trapped in the past. The episode begins with Wesley passed out in the lab, having been up all night making crystal meth because he found out he has an operable lung cancer and has turned to a life of crime. He's got to hustle it up to the bridge because they're going to perform a significant stellar experiment for Dr. Stubbs, who has seen the fulfillment of his life's work. Over and over again, the intense gravitational pull of the little neutron star sucks up the star material from the red giant, and it builds up on the surface until it explodes. I tell you this, Wesley, because it's an apt metaphor for what it feels like having to deal with you, understand? Every 196 years. Like clockwork. And it is but 18 hours away. What is Two Thumbs in Love's Exposition? Bob Kelso. There, got that reference out of the way early. Now we can remain totally focused on what's important, launching this giant shuttlecock. They're going to launch this thing, uh, it's known as the egg, at the neutron star when it explodes, you know, for science. But at the moment, everything goes to hell. The ship is lurching about, shields won't go up, it's drifting out of control towards stellar matter, and all the while the computer insists that everything's fine, and Picard stands up and says, Gentlemen, it's been a privilege playing with you tonight. Thanks to some manual overrides, which actually function, because the Enterprise D was built back when those things were actually important, they're able to stop with only limited damage. Now it's just a question of what the hell went wrong, you know, this time. Explain control malfunction. No control malfunction has been recorded. Oh, sounds like every trip I have to the mechanic. Uh, we don't see anything wrong with it. That'll be 200 bucks. As Stubbs is recovering from being thrown around on the bridge, Wesley shows up so they can broach the topic of Dr. Crusher disappearing for season two. I'm sure there were lots of things that she missed about Wesley while she was gone. I missed about two inches of him. It's two and a quarter inches now, Mom. I grew while you were gone. Stubbs seems to have taken a shine to Wesley, despite him being so focused on reading and studying. As I'm sure I don't have to tell you, Wesley's involvement in the operations of the Enterprise and rescuing him from peril on occasion did not go down terribly well with, well, pretty much anyone on Earth except for Gene. So Pillar's take on this was to actually call attention to the fact with this script, to instead of saying, young Wesley is a prodigy and we're so happy to have you, but rather... This kid's behavior is bordering on downright unhealthy. His comparison against Stubbs is to emphasize that, that in the older man we see Wesley as he might be in 40 years, a lonely intellectual who obsesses over his work because in the end, it's all he has. Life passed by and he never took time to enjoy it. That will show why Wesley needs to loosen up a little, because as we start to see, Stubbs is so wrapped up in his experiment because it's his legacy, and all he can really hope for is to be remembered for a great accomplishment that would have his life mean something in the end. Beverly is concerned, though, and asks Picard about him. He's his father's son. Honest. Trusting. Strong. Losing his hair. I mean, strong. As if to emphasize this, Wesley is currently bonding with the loner scientist who's explaining his life's work. We even comments that Wesley reminds him of himself. But it's interrupted by a red alert. The sensors show a Borg vessel is approaching. This is the first hint of them since Q Who and the second mention of them. The other was in peak performance, where Riker showed us just how different the pre-359 Federation really was. With the Borg threat, I decided that my officers and I needed to hone our tactical skills. In a crisis situation, it is prudent to have several options. I prefer brains over brawn as well. I think it's a waste of effort to test our combat skills. It's a minor province in the makeup of a starship captain. Well, now there's a sign a cube is coming, and that minor mishap has now caused Riker to shit his pants. But don't worry, it's just a computer malfunction, and he can go back to being a morally superior douchebag without worry. 
Things are worse, though. The manual controls aren't even working, although defensible compared to learning curve in that a manual control to power reality warping engines is going to require some kind of complex technology no matter what you do, while opening a door is not only low tech, but probably something required by a basic fire code. As Jordy works on trying to sort this out, Picard holds a mini-meeting to discuss this virtually unprecedented problem. Because the computer is capable of self-diagnosis and repair, there hasn't been a failure of this kind in nearly 80 years. And that was when Scotty spilled his drink on the CPU. They could always try to call tech support, though, I mean, if they're desperate. Rye and Jerry and Lunga. No, no, I, I already tried Lord. that. No, listen to me. That we tried me. that. It didn't work. For, for the love of the God, listen to me. Wait, no, don't put me on hold. No, oh, God damn it. Mateo, his eyes closed. Yes, it's the main computer for the Enterprise D. D, not B. D. Didn't I talk to you already? Don't screw you! Stubbs wants him to go forward no matter the consequences, even if it risks death. That's not exactly something that holds any fear for Stubbs, after all. They don't want to abandon the mission, but things don't look good. Something seems to be taking the computer apart, and Wesley realizes that the nanites he'd been experimenting with for a class project managed to escape the precautions he took of putting them in a shoe polish tin. He admits it to Guinan, but he isn't coming forward yet because he's not sure, and there's no sense tarnishing that save-the-ship reputation by admitting that he might have endangered it. So they make one final attempt to launch the egg, but instead of opening the shuttle bay, the comm system starts blasting stars and stripes forever, which, as you can imagine, pisses off a French patriot like Picard to no end. So he decides to abandon the mission and try to escape the system while they still can. Stubbs is broken up, naturally, saying he'd rather have failed than not even have had a chance to try. Well, I think this calls for a metaphor. Do you know baseball? Yes, my father taught it to me when I was young. <laughs> Once, centuries ago... Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. It was the beloved national pastime of the Americas, Wesley. Abandoned by a society that prized fast food and faster games. Lost to impatience. I respect your love of baseball if you have it, but there are better ways to show it than to deride the population for not supporting a multi-billion dollar sports industry like this. Especially when your argument is basically, how dare you not support it just because it's boring? Oddly enough, Stubbs' monologue that follows about baseball was what helped Pillar get the job of head writer. Rick Berman was a baseball junkie, and he liked that so much he gave Pillar a lot of support. Still, it is a nice speech. A brand new era in astrophysics. Postponed 196 years. Of rain. Wesley's traps have caught some of the nanites resulting from his experiment, and after his mom tries to talk to him about being overworked, he confesses the truth to her, which she then shares with the crew. Wesley had the nanites interacting with each other to try to increase their capabilities. And of course, monkeying about with autonomous self-replicating machines isn't the kind of thing anybody regulates around here. Well, now they're evolving because Wesley says it's true, and nothing more needs to be said on that topic. Stubbs wants them wiped out, but Dr. Crusher insists they may now be an intelligent life form, which has an unfortunate connection to what Guinan said to Wesley, comparing him to Dr. Frankenstein. And also, as discussed in the Matrix review, the mode of thinking of any artificial intelligence can be utterly incomprehensible to us, and should only be created with assurances that what you're doing will result in a being that is ultimately benevolent, not throwing caution to the wind and hoping you draw an inside straight. So the plan is for Wesley and Data to try to remove the nanites without harming them, but Dr. Stubbs refuses to take the chance of failure and blasts the main computer with a gamma ray gun to wipe them all out, at least the ones in this area. So, anybody on the ship can get that the means to create life, but we balance that out by having access to destroy life too. The nanites must think they're dealing with an Old Testament god here. So they respond like human life does, flooding the atmosphere with nitrous oxide air pollution. They fix it, but as Data notes, Stubbs undermined his own argument with that, because now the Nanites' retaliation indicates that they are taking action only intelligent beings could. Whoops. Got a monologue for that, Shoeless Joe? 
So Picard puts Data in charge of trying to talk to the Nanites somehow, while Dr. Stubbs is confined to quarters, with nothing to do but wait for Picard to kill the Nanites, and Troy to come by and talk about his feelings until he gets her to leave. Well, time to kick back and find your happy place. Lockman on first. Dark on second. Thompson at the plate. Today's pitching, tomorrow's catching, because is at center field. But seriously, baseball is an escape for many, and it's understandable Stubbs may want to turn to it as well. The then-recent film Field of Dreams tapped into that. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find that movie, so I had to go with the porn parody Field of Wet Dreams. But I, I think the message is still clear. Sit in shirt sleeves on a perfect afternoon. You'll find you have reserved seats somewhere along one of the baselines. Well, they sat when they were children and cheered their heroes. And they'll watch the game. And it'll be as if they'd dipped themselves in magic waters. The memories will be so thick that I'll have to brush them away from their faces. Ray, when the bank opens in the morning, they'll foreclose. People will come, Ray. Uh, if you want to check out other James Earl Jones films, there's uh, The Hunt for Miss October and The Empire's Got Back. Actually, the irony is that thinking about baseball is always a trick to use in bed. Now it's going to have the opposite effect. Anyway, the Nanites have redirected the power in this room to attack Stubbs, but luckily Dr. Crush is able to save him thanks to this ink cartridge. Well, with that, Picard feels he has no choice but to blast all the computer systems with gamma rays, hopefully without turning the crew into big green monsters. But at the last minute, the Nanites make contact through the Universal Translator and Data starts talking with him. To better help, Data figures he'll let the Nanites take temporary control of him to allow face-to-face -face negotiations to take place. Presumably, they could just gamma burst him and go in there with a soldering iron to fix whatever parts of his brain has been eaten if something goes wrong. You know, this may explain B4 from Nemesis. Or a lot of the really questionable things Data's said and done over the years, for that matter. Spiner does a great job as the Nanite possessed Data in both the voice and mannerisms, and the scene works a lot better than the similar ugly bags of mostly water bit from Home Soil. Picard explains the mission, and Stubbs offers a very sincere sounding apology, and given that the man has shown little humility throughout this episode, I'm inclined to think he's being sincere. Picard offers to help them, so they relocate the Nanites to an uninhabited planet, but first they have the uh, computer fixed up so Stubbs can launch his egg in time, and we close out with Dr. Crusher worrying over Wesley. Uh, yeah, let's get out. The post-episode follow-up. Annoying character goes to Dr. Crusher. It's good to have her back, but mothering over Wesley got to be a bit too much. We have a Brahma of the Week for the Nanites that Wesley gave intelligence. Final score for Evolution is 4 out of 10. It kicks off an era that will raise the bar for TNG substantially, but the episode itself is slightly below average for the entire series. This field, this game, is a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good, and it could be again. Oh, people will come, Ray. People will most definitely come. Has he ever been in love? Um...